I'm going to be talking today about our Enlightenment Foundation Library 2.0 and more like what we're trying to go to get there. And that's a lot of ideas that are going on there. And it's still like early time, so you can still join and participate in the discussion. So I am sitting by, I'm working for a Samsung open source group uh, in Mountain View, and I've been working on EFL for more than a decade now, I think. Uh, time pass. Um, and so for people who don't know what EFL is, I will just go quickly over what it is. It's uh, a toolkit created for Enlightenment 17. Uh, Enlightenment 17 has been like a long coming project. Uh, it was started in 97 and it only was released in 2011. I remember correctly. Uh, and the reason it took so much time to do a window manager uh, is because we didn't just fully rewrite it, but we also write a toolkit to make it possible. And uh, we designed this toolkit for mostly all need and what we were thinking of what was going to be the future or when we started, and it was embedded device. And we're designing Enlightenment and EFL to be able to scale and to be running on embedded device. Or a few years later, Samsung did pick it up, or and it does fit Samsung in, in embedded device. So every device that is not Android phone pretty much is usually is now running with Enlightenment and EFL. That means TV, camera, fridge, uh, digital appliance, pretty much anything that has a screen will be running with Enlightenment and EFL. As it is now used in products, we have very strong goal and will to try to not break API and ABI because that means that we will be breaking application. Uh, that is really core to EFL and we are in the process of making the release 1.21 of EFL. Uh, the first number means that we have not we have tried to not break API since 1.0, and so that's a 21 version on, on 1.0. Um, Misapp does happen. Uh, sometimes we are at a point where uh, some people are relying on bugs to make the application working. I mean, it has been 10 years since, uh, more than 10 years, so there is this kind of things, and so you end up with a situation where you actually fix a bug or you break application. It's kind of an interesting challenge coming there. So even if EFL was designed for a window manager, uh, it's now used for any type of application. Uh, it is doing its own rendering. It has its own scene graph, and this scene graph has been developed over more than a decade, so it's one of the most optimized one you can find. It's Targeting to reduce CPU, GPU, memory usage, and that does lead to actually saving battery. Uh, the optimization, I mean, you are pushing 60 frames per second, you're not going to be seeing more than that. But the battery usage is going to be something you will notice. So once you are fast, that's good, but the next step is also to be efficient on the energy usage of your stack which is um, one of the things that we have been spending in the past uh, few years uh, working on EFL. Obviously, you need international support. That means being able to support uh, left to right, right to left, UTF-8, uh, translation, and all of these things. So that's part of the toolkit. Uh, you need to be able to scale. Uh, that means scale from number of CPU, from screen, from GPU, without GPU, with input device of all kind of form and shape with different precision and latency. And so we do have a lot of code to handle all this variation uh, in the toolkit itself. We also support accessibility. Uh, and being on targeting on the device, the ability to completely customize the look of your toolkit has been really important. So we do have our fully themable uh, layer engine for, for EFL, and that's kind of core of EFL too. Uh, and to mix all of these parameters, because it's a lot of configuration, uh, we have a notion of profile, and you can attach a profile per screen. So 
when you move your application from one screen to another, it will reconfigure itself to fit for that screen and the input method that are linked to that screen. Uh, but all of that doesn't come with a huge cost. Uh, we can make EFL fit into eight megabytes uh, we, with a minimal set of dependency. It's very modular, we can remove things. Uh, it does really scale down quite a lot, which is pretty neat. But 15 years of organic grow with our no refactoring of the API because that's breaking application. Um, it is, has been also a very strong focus on performance and new feature and not much on API. So we have been a multiplication, like multiplication of API, or different behavior on which part of the library you are using because they are not the same object model and stuff like that. So we have been starting for now more than a, two years to be working on EFL2. And basically the goal, the, the main goal that we have is to make it easier for people. And one of the main way to make things easier for people is actually to provide them a full support for the language they prefer. Because everyone has their favorite language and we are, I think, enough in this room that everyone has a different language they like. And so, of course, we have thousands of API for our toolkit the size of EFL, and it will not be something that will scale if we have to write bindings manually. So, obviously, we need a way to generate bindings efficiently for every language we can, and in a maintainable way. We want also to have documentation that does match each language, uh, so that uh, we have also the documentation that does fit your use of, of the toolkit so that you don't rely on the C documentation to be able to actually use it in Python. That is something that would be kind of harder on people. So that is kind of really the core of the, of the work. And we want also to make sure that when we do a release, the day of the release, every bindings has actually full support for all, all of, of the new API we are pushing. So from there, it also pushes us to have a simpler API. So we want to have the same function across all part of the, of the libraries because EFL is a mix of libraries. And so we want to make sure that we have the same object model, the same event system, the same asynchronous system. Uh, we want to have refactor all of that. And we want to do that by also being, I mean, we are in 2018 now. We want to be a little bit more modern uh, and do proper lifecycle support and make sure that the lifecycle support that we have does match every binding so that they have, like in C++, you will have AI, AI, AI uh, and so only reference, no pointer. Uh, we want to make sure that all of these things are available to, to you. And, oops, oh. sorry. Uh, and so, one of the big thing is we realize it's a lot of work. And we cannot really release EFL 2.0 right away and say, now there is no application working anymore and you have to just work and port your application. All the toolkit have been trying to do that and they have a huge community and they were able to move and it took them almost a decade. So that is not something as an enlightened community we can actually do because we don't have the scale. So we want to maintain, and that's very important to us, API and ABI compatibility and for as long as possible. So basically you will be able to use the legacy API alongside EFL API, new API in the same binary. So you can actually start migrating part of your code to the new, uh, new system without breaking the old system. And that's really core. This is mostly for C application. It might be also possible with Python because today we have really one big binding that is maintained and that's a Python binding. And so it will be neat if we can manage that also with Python. But for sure, we are doing it with C, and at the C level, at least, uh, your application will not be broken, and you will be able to slowly migrate 
to the new API. Also, uh, we want to preserve our, all the benefit of EFL, our, and that means also we want to preserve that at the binding level. So if we were to do C++, we want to make sure that the indirection that you go through in C++ is not going to cost you anything and that you should be at the same performance level as if you were in C. And our, so I will be talking maybe later a bit more about C++ bindings uh, because that was the first binding that was actually uh, being think through this um, system. But we want to preserve energy efficiency, we want to preserve memory usage, and we want to spread the of all scalability. Basically, everything that make EFL today, we want to preserve that, and we just want to change the entry point uh, and make sure that when you write an application with EFL, you will be able to really use all of these features and performance that is there uh, without making an application that will be blocking or anything. So one of the core things that we are doing is a new object model for EFL. Uh, it, we are naming it EO, but that's really just the library name. It's not really that important. It's, it's basically cleaning up all our object model uh, into one that does ref counting with parent relationship also. Uh, it's very simple, classic uh, life cycle. We have constructor, finalize, we have our uh, destructor, like really classic things there. Each object can uh, carry events, and all of that is a new object model. But that was not enough uh, for us to actually be addressing our bindings. So for bindings need, we came up, um, we didn't want to reinvent a new language to do uh, all the documentation of our binding generator. We didn't want to go like Vala, or uh, we didn't uh, want to switch to a new uh, language. We wanted to continue to be uh, C and then enable binding on top. So we worked on a language that's named Aeolian, and that one does look like that. And it's basically kind of JSON looking like, kind of not. Uh, but the idea is that uh, in that uh, language, you can describe all your object property, all your function. You can provide parameters that will say each function is going to be doing what. And you also provide documentation. So I have, I have removed a lot of the documentation that is actually in the real uh, EO file uh, because it will not fit in the screen. But the idea is that the binding generator can actually read the documentation and transform that into the documentation that you expect in that language. And uh, there is already uh, uh, the C-sharp binding during that, uh, because in C-sharp people expect documentation to be in XML, and uh, so there is some automatic redo of the documentation, and that is generating uh, proper C-sharp documentation. Um, we also put into the, I was just saying just before, that in EO we have objects with events on it. And so events and all of the, like really all the behavior of the object is documented in the EO file. And that generates not just the binding, but also all the C boilerplate. So when you are writing a C, you, a C class, you will actually get a, a dot H generated from the EO file and a dot C. And when you include that into your C file, your function will be properly type checked and everything. It will be just you have a static function to implement all of the placeholders there. You will notice that the alien file is only about the public API. There is nothing about private function. There is nothing about like private data, nothing like that that is exposed. And you can have all the private function and private data you want outside of the EO file. The EO file is the public interface of, uh, of EFL uh, 2.0, basically. We are working on tools that are going to do automatic audit of our entire uh, EO file to make sure that we are coherent and that nothing is missing, uh, that there is no like redundant things. And that is looking quite, quite well for now. We have automatic warning when we are adding new function, if we are doing something that is looking like something is already is there or things like that, to just 
notify us early on uh, that some feature might be better expressed some other way. One other, other thing that we are doing is that EFL was a bunch of library with very weird names. It was Evas, Ecor, Edge, Elementary, which doesn't ring a bell to anyone about what they could be doing. Um, so when you were a beginner, that was a, really a steep uh, starting point because you really didn't know where to start from. So with the new uh, API, we're looking to start with three type of application and you will have core, net, and UI, uh, which already talk by themselves about what each of them do. And, uh, and that will be your entry point into the library. Uh, you will be linking to EFL core, EFL UI, or EFL net, and you will be including EFL core on net or UI, and that's it. And you should not see any more um, namespace that are kind of fun, but if you want to be more mainstream, uh, it's, it's required to be a little bit less creative on the naming, I think. Um, and we are also still trying to do a lot of the automatic in, uh, instantiation and create, uh, initialization of EFL for you. And we still support some uh, old technique to do a uh, fast starting of your application. It's something we really use in, uh, in Tizen. Uh, to, we basically pre-start EFL in a process pool, and when you start an application, it is right away, EFL is already initialized, and you can just in, take one of its pending process and say, launch that binary from there. And it does a little bit of magic with DL open uh, and manage to start the main loop from there. So we are keeping all of that. And building your application will be around the main loop. And the main loop provides you also with the application lifecycle. It's something that is really important uh, on an embedded device uh, because you have the possibility to have your application being paused, resume, or terminate. And, and the idea is uh, when you have pressure on the system, or uh, some component on the system will tell you uh, now you should actually pause. And the idea is that all your graphic resource will be dumped and if you have an application and you want to be more um, nicely behaving with the system, you can, for example, start to slow down the amount of time you get data from the network or drop some stuff from your memory and things like that. So all of this lifecycle is now part of EFL and it's actually something that is automatically also working on the desktop. And so on the desktop, uh, what we do is that when you minimize uh, your application, it does pause, and when you maximize, it does resume. And that is something that is uh, working per window and at the level of the application too. So you can have behavior on each window or at the application level. The main loop uh, is, is core to basically all the event driving in your application, obviously, so it does provide or information of when the main loop is idle and doing nothing. It enables you to asynchronously schedule jobs. And as I was talking just before, uh, we are having this problem of uh, bug compatibility. And so to address uh, the bug compatibility, we are pushing uh, basically, you are not just saying which, which EFL version you did build with, but which EFL version you did develop with uh, on the main loop, and that will configure the entire system to be as much bug compatible as we can with that version of EFL. It's not like a, a silver bullet solution, because if you are using libraries that are using EFL itself, it will mean that everyone has to be synchronized on that version of EFL, but uh, it does already help for a lot of scenario for us. Um, one of the evolution we have, that is uh, kind of silly to say, but uh, we have, when we did build EFL, we did build EFL in independent component. Uh, the idea when we started 2001 was we didn't want to make EVAS, the scene graph and a rendering library, be our EFL only component because we were thinking it's a lot of work to do ourselves and 
every toolkit should be actually be using that. And so that component and a lot of the logic of EFL at the time was every component is individual and can be reused in another toolkit. Uh, we were expecting that maybe all the toolkit will be picking it up and doing their rendering with the scene graph. Well, most toolkit didn't use the scene graph for another decade, and so it was a waste of time on all sides uh, to do this this way, and it actually started to make things more complex than it should have been. And one of the places where it has been more complex is animation. Uh, basically, if you are want to do an animation, you need to have a main loop. But if you want to have a main loop, then you are looking to lock your canvas with a specific main loop. And so then you are linking yourself with a specific toolkit. With EFL 2.0, basically we are saying, well, there is no point. Every toolkit wants to work in their own way and we should do more to work uh, easier to work yourself. And so the canvas now is using the main loop. It's actually dependent on the main loop to be there. And if you want to drive an animation, you can actually drive the animation of an object from the canvas and you have the animation synchronization there. It goes even further than that, especially on Wayland, uh, the, the animation tick is per window. So it's a good thing that it's actually linked with the canvas. And so it actually op allows us for optimization where uh, we can actually make sure that we are ticking at the frame rate of the screen per window. But even if we are, for example, uh, the, the window is only visible in a small tray, this one doesn't need to be refreshed at 60 frames per second. So we can actually get Wayland to only request 30, 15 frames per second for the window. And with the new API, you are actually very easily able to get that animation tick to be completely calibrated to the system. And that leads to a lot of optimization because obviously our, your animation is what consumes the most of your energy when you are doing graphics. So being able to dynamically adapt on the use case um, is also useful. So it's not just about making things simpler, but in some cases it's a real uh, improvement on, on the technical uh, performance side of things. One of the problem we have with current API is that it's actually hard for people to do asynchronous work uh, because we only have events and you have race condition and you have to get all of these things in the right order, right way. So we are trying to find a proper way to express a series of commands into an asynchronous way. Uh, it's still a lot of discussion there, but um, the promised future uh, that is radically what C++ is having, uh, JavaScript is kind of the same thing. Uh, pretty much every language today has this kind of feature. Uh, is something that we are starting to roll into multiple places in EFL. And that does allow you to chain command uh, step by step and not forget to unref an object, but do that after you have actually used the property to actually put the object at some place and so on. So that's where we are uh, on the asynchronous thing. And we really look for our, like chaining action because that's one of the things that is the most confusing when you are doing asynchronous things is that you have to synchronize things together and you have to do them in the right order asynchronously. So <laughs> it's, a, it's not a trivial thing for a lot of people. And so we are hoping that um, this kind of pattern are going to be enabling uh, people to do things more easily. One of the big problem we had in EFL uh, was the network part. It has been very, a very weird API for a long time. And so a full redo of the, of the API has been done and it now completely abstracts the protocol. So if you are using UDP, TCP, HTTP, or even like SSH and HTTP in the same like stacking pipe, at the end you are still able to send data in the same way. And you can actually chain all this uh, protocol one of, their, of each other quite easily. And that's like really enable a much easier time with network, especially today when like pretty much everything has to be networked. So that's a, a big change too. 
Uh, as I was saying, we are moving to a more meaningful name for most of our Canva, uh, for namespace. So before we had Evas, which was or Canvas, but it was also Canvas for vector graphics. It was also for 3D objects, and everything was kind of there into weird namespace. So today we have uh, we are introducing four namespace. We have Canvas, which are for 2D graphics primitive. We have the Canvas VG, which is for vector graphics primitive. Uh, we have Canvas 3D, which is for 3D primitive. It's not like we want to do games. It's just if we want to display a small 3D icon or things like that, uh, being able to push that into the Canvas makes sense. Especially if you were to enable one day a 3D uh, stereoscopic view or things like that, you kind of need the information at the canvas level to be able to do that automatically. So that's, that's why it's there. And then EFL UI is where all the higher level widgets are. So that's where you will find your button, your list, your checkbox, all of these um, high level widgets. And when we were doing this canvas, this namespace, uh, we realized that we have a lot of function that are spread around all of our namespace. For example, file set. We have file set on Evas. We have file set on every single object, pretty much, of elementary. And it's like, it should be just EFL file set for every object that is actually providing a file set feature. So a lot of the refactoring has been to go around, figure out all of the functions that have the same behavior idea behind them and refactor that. So there is a lot of, uh, of this interface that have been going all the way back to EFL namespace and have uh, this kind of uh, abstraction for you. Um, so the current state for us is the canvas part is pretty much done. Uh, EFL canvas namespace is done. Uh, EFL core is, there is some parts that we are not really uh, settled down on, especially regarding threading. Uh, that is an API that is not looking like we really want. Uh, there is, uh, network is pretty much done. Uh, I don't think there will be much change on that. But the EFL UI part where we have all the widgets is where we have a lot of work. And we kind of did a mistake there because we were thinking we can actually just wrap the old widgets with a new API and we will have things fine. But that's where we realize that some of the API have weird behavior that are borderline being bugs. And so when you start to want to fix this behavior that were kind of bad, then you realize that you are breaking the legacy API and your new widgets. Uh, and so you have conflict there and it makes life a lot more like harder than we think it was. And it was actually way easier to do clean from scratch widgets than it was to actually rely on the old widgets. And we did spend a lot of time trying to reuse the old thing for the new one. And uh, that was not really a good decision when we now are a year later after that. It's easy to say that now, but when we were into it, it was making sense to reuse code, but now it's kind of, yeah, too much conflict. So from there, uh, we are trying to first focus uh, on making the minimum set of uh, widgets that we need for Samsung. Uh, that means providing touchscreen, uh, mobile, and TV uh, set. Uh, so typically, there is toolbar and menu that are not useful, for example, on any of these devices, uh, but they are really useful on desktop. So for the first release, uh, we are unlikely to have that widget there, but it's not really a big problem, I think, because as we say, we have legacy API still working. So you should be able to mix the legacy toolbar widget with the, with the new uh, widget, and you should be able to do your application. Uh, on the long term, we will be obviously uh, working on providing um, the missing widgets because uh, we want a full uh, support there. There is no point into not supporting the desktop use case. So as you understand, there is still a lot of work ahead. And so there is a long ongoing discussion about how we do thread and that is like really going on. Uh, mainly the discussion is how do we provide, the people have been requesting thread safety. 
But in C, you cannot do thread safety, except if you have one big lock, and every time you access a function, everything lock. But that's not really useful, because then you have not really multiple thread running at the same time. The other way around is to have thread, the object that only live in one thread, but then you cannot easily access a thread object from another thread. And so you are in a limited place. The last step is to try to find a way to do smaller locking into the object system so that you actually are able to uh, get your object living in all thread, but you then don't have thread safety. Because in that case, it's depending on the user to properly synchronize all of its thread to not do access on an object that is dying or an object that is in the wrong state. So C basically make it impossible to have a fast thread safety model. Uh, and that's kind of the discussion there because we are, there is two direction, either we provide something fast, but then there is risk that the user do something bad. But that's mostly something that will impact the C user and not anyone on another language pretty much. Well, maybe not C++, C++ but um, like if you do Python, it's really unlikely that you're able to do these kind of bad things. So that's a really ongoing discussion there, uh, if you want to join the fun. <laughs> uh, the other part of the infrastructure that we are still working on, uh, and that is also uh, really going to be an important new feature, is to have a model view, uh, view model infrastructure. So most people are no MVC, uh, but MVC kind of lacks some of the design uh, that MVVM do provide. Especially with MVVM, you can really easily get the view out and replace it with a view test and make sure that your model does behave, in the view model does behave actually in the way you want. And you can actually almost test everything that will drive your UI from the test without having to make the, the view uh, run. That's one of the really nice part of it. And if you can switch your view so easily, uh, it means that you have a reusability of your component that is pretty high. So it's pretty simple as a, as a principle. You basically are just connecting property on the view to the view model, and the view model is a proxy to models. And so the view model just do some of the math or basically it say, oh, I need to know if this task, if this property say it's urgent, so I should send a color red. And when you connect to that property, it will actually change the color of your label to red just because the view model will have done that uh, mathematic uh, there. So that's kind of the idea. There is a lot of work to make that uh, work smoothly and provide interesting model. So we want to have all the network thing, I mean, JSON, RPC, um, uh, and whatnot. So that are like more long-term work that need to be done. Um, on the short term, uh, we have been working already on improving uh, documentation tutorials. So we already have documentation being written for C, and we have been reorganizing our website to support uh, more language, for also for tutorials. So you have all the reference API that will be generated for your language in what uh, your ID expect and everything, but it will also be online on our website. And we also are trying to get space for tutorials on our website for every language. We really want to make sure that whichever language you, you are using, you should be able to find an easy entry uh, and be able to figure out how things are working without having to understand how C work. Um, that's, uh, so we are reorganizing the website, the way we generate documentation, the way we maintain it. Uh, hopefully all of that work together well. The, one of the problem with all of these tutorial and things is that basically it's code on a website and code on a website is not compiled by any tools. And so one of the things we're really trying to improve is making sure that all of this code is also part of the continuous integration system and we have tests covering all of that. 
which is another level of challenge because uh, they are in different language and things like that. So it's, it's not really, uh, well, when you have been doing unit tests for C, that's not the same thing for JavaScript. And so there is a lot of uh, questions that are still open there. And also a lot of these tests are actually um, visual. So it's not just because it compiles that it works. You want to actually execute the test and see how it does render on screen and how it does behave with input and things like that. So there is a lot of work going on on how to improve the way we do testing. Uh, that is for the integration testing. With, with the EO language, uh, we have received some proposal to actually have uh, some kind of automatic testing of the API itself by defining precondition and postcondition for every API in the EO file. So basically, when you look at your API, you say, here you can get an int. But you don't know what the range of that int is going to be. And you also don't know how it will affect all the property on the object. And so one of the ideas that has been proposed is to have precondition and postcondition that will actually generate test code that will actually be run and will be checking if when you do this value in that range, it does behave as the API say. And that will actually help us have more automatic testing of for API. Um, so that's also an area that is long-term uh, research and work at the moment. Um, obviously, one of the big thing we want is uh, parity, uh, feature parity on our widget with legacy. So this is kind of a weird problem because we don't want to just take a feature and put it into a, new, a widget in the new API. We have to think twice about why is this feature there? How is it used? And depending on how it is used, actually maybe it's a completely different widget that we need to implement on the other side. So it's, it's not as trivial as to say, okay, we need to just copy all of this API and put it there and we are done. Well, there is a lot of thinking that needs to be done. And that has been also slowing us down uh, more than we expected because we have to think about the user a lot and how they are using current API. So it's one of the things that Samsung has been helping us uh, quite a lot there because we already have a lot of user internally. And so we can go around and say, how do you use that widget? How do you use this API? What do you do with it? And, and sometimes it's, it's really silly. We have all of this uh, vector graphics canvas. It's really optimized. It's really, it was like really a lot of work to get it there. Well, the only thing they do with it is draw rounded rectangle. That's it. They do rounded rectangle for buttons, and that's the only thing they do with it. So it's, it doesn't make sense to actually expose this kind of feature and try to put a lot of effort into making things more powerful there, because if the only thing they need is rounded rectangle, then well, we're pretty much done there. <laughs> so. There is, yeah, there has been a lot of, of these things going on, trying to figure out what the user are doing, what they want to do, and where we are going. And I am running toward the end of uh, my talk, and so if anyone has any questions. Sorry? Uh, so we do have, uh, so we have first, we have two layer of graphical backend. We have all, the acceleration layer, so I will say that's a software, which the, we have software which is optimized for Neon, uh, all the Intel, MMX, SSE, and all the families there. Uh, we have GL and GLES support. Uh, we don't have Vulkan at the moment there. Uh, one of the reasons we were not supporting Vulkan and we are not for the moment is that uh, we, can, we could not uh, import texture from another application into uh, a Vulkan texture at the moment. Uh, and I think it's doable with 1.1, but I have not looked enough. I have just heard it was doable. But uh, without that, we cannot make enlightenment work, and uh, we don't really expect a lot of performance benefits from Vulkan uh, on our side. Uh, we, 
we are pretty much not CPU, not GPU bound in most of our rendering in EFL. Uh, the only gain we will have is if we are able to uh, save on battery usage. So, and it's not really obvious how to do that because Vulkan is very powerful when you do multi-threading. But if you do multi-threading, you may actually do too many of them and start to ramp up the frequency. And so it is not a trivial task for our context. And so that way we are not doing it. And then we have the other layer for uh, the backend, which is the display system. So here we have X11, we have WLAN, we have SDL, we have our uh, Apple Mac OS 10 thing, I don't know what it is. We have Windows, um, we have DRM, uh, KMS DRM, uh, we have just frame buffer, uh, I think that might be it, I'm not sure. Maybe I'm missing some, but yeah, give you an idea. You had a question? Uh, Gustavo has been pointing out a lot of uh, uh, optimization there, that was, um, not optimization, design, that was uh, done uh, in the MVC of uh, Elevate. Um, we have kind of, yeah, we have merged a lot of the design there. Uh, the, the way it worked now is you have a property get that is actually uh, synchronous property set is asynchronous and you have an event that tell you when our property has changed on your model and the model view and the model have the same API. So basically you don't really, from the viewpoint, the view itself, you have only one API to handle which is connecting to a property and watching the property change or not. And that's pretty much it. on Enlightenment website, on enlightenment.org uh, itself. It's, um, so we did look at other language and we did a survey of everything we could find and nothing was meeting our need because we wanted to be able to do, oh, I forgot about that. We wanted to generate the C++ binding as a fully static uh, either so that when you actually compile your C++ application, at the end, it only depends on the C API. And if you change anything on the system, there is no component in between. So the C++ will be basically directly using the C API without any overhead and no, uh, no code into a library in between. And to do so, uh, we, want, we needed to be able to do static generation of this either at compilation time and we realized from that starting point that uh, we wanted our own language, uh, which is Aeolian, to generate all of that. Any other question? Okay, well, thank you, and good luck for the game.